Good morning and a warm welcome to this uh, public webinar organized by the Japan program at the VUB in which we decided to look at the perspectives and policies of three important players, Europe, Japan and India in the Indo-Pacific. The idea is to explore uh, their convergences, their interests and their policies in order to see where we can eventually cooperate in a trilateral multilateral framework. Anyone watching the developments uh, on the Indo-Pacific scene must have noticed this uh, incredible pace uh, in which the three actors have stepped up their, their policies over the recent, uh, recent years, starting with the rapprochement between Europe and Japan already since 2018, with the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy, which was published only last month, and culminating, of course, with um, a rapprochement, notable rapprochement between Europe and India, uh, as we could see uh, by the leaders summit, which was held only this weekend. And while those bilateral interactions are extremely important, we thought um, it is uh, crucial to also take into consideration the trilateral or eventually quadrilateral interactions that uh, can be taking place uh, within these formations. Um, now, I'm delighted to be surrounded, of course, uh, with um, experts from these three uh, partner countries. And before uh, giving the floor to our keynote speaker, let me just remind you a little bit of the rules uh, of the game. This is a public event, so you cannot be seen or see your fellow participants, but you are most welcome to post your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. This event will be recorded and posted on the Japan Programs YouTube channel. So without further ado, let me turn to Ambassador Shimokawa uh, for his keynote address. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is the sort of technical uh, issues that we have to be dealing with. Um, sorry, and of course, I have to apologize for this inconvenience. Okay, well, if it's like that, I heard that uh, we may have a little bit of delay from uh, the embassy. Uh, so perhaps in the meanwhile, uh, we could start already by our first panel, uh, which will be looking at maritime security. And uh, quite expectedly, um, in terms of experts, we decided to pick three perspectives, a European one, an Indian one, and a Japanese one starting with our lady uh, on the panel, <laughs> Dr. Garima Mohan, who despite the name will be actually looking at the uh, European perspective. Garima has been uh, a senior fellow at the GMF, at the German Marshall Fund now, uh, taking care of South Asia or India developments, but she's been also very closely watching uh, all the uh, latest developments in EU-India ties, including the latest uh, summit. So Garima, thank you very much for, for being with us this morning. Um, if you could, you know, say a few words about, you know, how this relationship came uh, to be, what would be the European interest in the Indian Ocean region, if you want, but in the Indo-Pacific more broadly, uh, and what are the main takeaways from from the recent summit? You know, what does it stem? What what would it mean also for the possible trilateral cooperation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you first of all to Eva and the Japan program at the VB for this wonderful opportunity. I've been watching with close interest the work that you've been doing, especially uh, with your webinars, and uh, very happy to be a part of this discussion. Um, I will structure my comments in two sections, um, Eva answering your questions, starting first with the EU's Indo-Pacific um, Council conclusions, how the debate in Europe has shifted, um, and then talk about the whole like-minded partners question, particularly focusing on India, but also looking at the emerging regional security architecture in the Indo-Pacific and where Europe can plug in, and what will be the uh, pitfalls that that we'll in Europe we'll have to be careful about. Um, so starting with the EU's Indo-Pacific outlook, 
it's incredible how far this debate has come in Brussels, in European capitals. If you were watching this, there were only a few of us, I remember a few years ago, harping on about it. And there was really no uptake from the official side because it was seen as you know, a concept developed far away and Europe doesn't really know what to do with it to now that we have member states like France, Germany, Netherlands adopting their own national strategies. And in the month of April, we saw the EU come out with its own council conclusions for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. For those not uh, familiar with the technical terms, this means that this has been adopted by member states and will now go through the motions within EU institutions formally adopted somewhere around September. Um, focusing just on the EU, because our panel says Europe, but I'll focus on the EU in particular here. Uh, I thought it is the, the council conclusions were very balanced and uh, show quite a realistic approach of what the EU can do in this considerably vast region. Um, it talks about where the EU brings added value, first of all. And the second part is how to cooperate with partners in the Indo-Pacific, uh, work with them, not just in the Indo-Pacific. So um, in addition to increasing European engagement in the region, in addition to projection in the region, it also really talks about how to develop alliances, coalitions with partners in the Indo-Pacific. And I think that that is interesting for those watching developments in the region where we've seen a lot of um, issue-based coalitions come up exactly these trilaterals, quadrilaterals, minilaterals that, that we've been talking about. Uh, the areas the EU wants to um, work on in particular, where it brings an added value, are trade, investment, and supply chains, obviously. The second being global health, which is the biggest crisis facing us today. Um, the third being high quality and critical infrastructure, um, or connectivity, as the EU likes to call it. Um, and then finally, of course, security and defense, focusing on maritime security, cybersecurity, um, responding to emerging technologies, disruptive tech, as they call it. Um, and of course, enhanced maritime presence and more coordination in the region, a very interesting instrument mentioned in the Council conclusions that I'll talk about in a minute. <clears throat> Overall, I think what this um, document tries to do is give strategic direction to what the EU is already doing in the region, and it is doing a lot. Um, and second, it talks about working with like-minded partners. I think this is the new part, because before um, Europe had uh, partnerships with almost every country, but prioritizing some as like-minded partners could lead to interesting permutations and combinations emerging in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and then, of course, as always, as all European countries, the EU says that it wants to have an inclusive approach um, to the Indo-Pacific, which is often code that we do not want to pick sides between the US and China. But what I also found interesting is in the document, it says we want to work closely with countries who already have Indo-Pacific strategies, thereby um, sort of mentioning in a subtle way um, who the EU's like-minded partners are and who it would like to work with. And I think this is um, an important distinction, which for instance is not made in the German strategy on the Indo-Pacific, which is indeed very inclusive and covers almost every topic imaginable. Um, since this topic, this panel is on maritime security, let's pivot to that now. And um, the EU has a lot of existing policies in the Indo-Pacific um, addressing many of the maritime security concerns, those in the maritime domain. Now, the theater is quite vast. And we, if we look at it and divide it into sub-regions, of course, the EU has many programs in the Eastern Indian Ocean, um, information sharing and maritime domain awareness programs like CRIMARIO that have now been expanded from the Indian Ocean to, to Southeast Asia as well. Um, general maritime security cooperation, cybersecurity, capacity building in South Southeast Asia. And now we're also seeing more and more statements against those who violate international rules in the area. For example, the no verbal we saw from the E3 
Um, also the recent statement on the South China Sea, a uh, little bit more that we are seeing. And I think what's really interesting is the new coordinated maritime presences instrument would be very interesting to see how that develops, um, whereby the EU would like to create, and I quote, permanent and visible presence in the region. Um, so I think there is a lot the EU is doing. The challenge now is to how do you work with like-minded partners? What are the gaps in the region where the EU can come in and bring in an added value, as it says in the strategy? Um, and where do the EU's partners want it to participate, thereby creating a burden sharing um, arrangement? And I think here, one has to be very careful because a lot of European countries are extra regional and do not have experience in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, let me give you an example. Germany, for example, said that it will uh, send a frigate to the Indo-Pacific, which will make port calls um, in like-minded countries like Australia and Japan. At the same time, the German statement said it would transit through the South China Sea, but avoid the 12 nautical mile. Uh, by saying it out loud, they have not only, they sort of legitimized claims of countries which are contested in the region. Um, and therefore, even how we frame our engagement in the Indo-Pacific is extremely important uh, and will have consequences. I was later told that now the German frigate will also make a port call in China. Um, now on this issue, who are your like-minded partners? It is not the country that is openly contesting these norms. So what is the point of this frigate? Is it to show symbolic support for your partners in the region who are actually complaining about aggressive behavior of countries? Or is it to maintain you know, uh, support or uphold freedom of navigation in the region? Again, both of these are not quite met because of the um, hesitancy to take a position in the region. So I think these are some of the um, issues that we might run into when we engage more with the Indo-Pacific and try to take a strategic posture, which then makes it extremely important to coordinate with your partners. And that brings me to the India bit. Now we saw uh, a leader summit happen um, on Saturday with the Indian prime minister and all 27 heads of state of European countries, very rare format, only used once or twice before, for US presidents uh, was offered to China last year, but then reduced to a much smaller format due to tensions in the partnership and the coronavirus pandemic. Um, of course, this statement says that EU and India want to work more in the Indo-Pacific and they have constituted a maritime security dialogue. I think these mechanisms are extremely important because this is how the EU will find out what its partners want from it what they expect and where can it come in where there are gaps in the regional architecture. And I think this is a good segue into our next two uh, participants. I'll stop here, but of course, happy to go into details um, if you want to know more about the summit itself, um, what are the prospects for what has the EU put on the table for India, why it happened. But of course, I'm mindful that the panel uh, is about maritime security. Um, and India, Japan, and Europe. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Garima. Uh, this was excellent uh, also as a prelude uh, in a way to, to all the discussions that we may be having because uh, afterwards, because the EU's Indo-Pacific uh, strategy is, of course, not just about maritime security, but also of other priority areas. Now, um, I know that this is a, a, an unusual way of doing things, and I would uh, probably ask um, uh, forgiveness to our two speakers, uh, Abhijit and, and Satoru, afterwards, but we now have the connection with Ambassador Shimokawa. Uh, so if, uh, if I could beg your, your indulgence and patience, I would uh, ask uh, Ambassador Shimokawa to step in now, perhaps with his keynote address before we continue the rest of the panel, if that's okay. Ambassador? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. I think the video is blocked by you. I, I cannot uh, uh, de-block my uh, video. So uh, I think you have the control over my video. I... I'm, I'm trying to sort of uh, 
the block the uh, video. I, 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 I succeeded in doing that for the microphone, but the video. Okay, here I am. Here I go. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for this uh, technical problem that uh, we uh, rarely have, but ha happened uh, uh, this morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to give a, a keynote speech. Uh, uh, honorable speakers, uh, professors, ladies and gentlemen, and dear uh, Eva, dear Celine. Uh, um, first of all, uh, let me introduce the international environment surrounding us. Uh, it is said that the shift in the global power balance has increased uh, the importance of Asia Pacific region, region, both politically and economically. But this is accompanied by a security environment in East Asia, which is becoming more severe and uncertain. Against this backdrop, the regional cooperation framework in the Asia Pacific region in terms of security is not sufficiently institutionalized. Uh, in this connection, Japan is promoting the view of the free and open Indo-Pacific, FOIP, uh, focusing on several pillars such as promotion and consolidation of uh, fundamental principles such as rule of law the international in the in the international community number two pursuit of economic prosperity including through ensuring connectivity and promoting FTAs and EPAs and three commitment to peace and stability in, including maritime security since maintaining and strengthening the rule-based international order cannot be achieved by Japan alone, we will not exclude any country to cooperate widely with our partners who share the view of FOIP to realize it. FOIP uh, does not uh, intend to create new organization or to compete with existing institutions, but it is an inclusive vision where any country can express its support or its intention to be part of. In the absence of collective defense framework in East Asia and region, uh, the defense and security of regions has been engaged, ensured through a number of bilateral alliances with the United States, which constitutes so-called a hub and spoke structure. This combination of bilateral alliances which provides deterrence combined with uh, multilateral frameworks, which provides peer pressure through dialogue is likely to be the basis for peace and security in the region in the years to come. European countries and India are important partners for Japan who share fundamental values and principles such as freedom, democracy, the rule of law and human rights. We geographically separated, but con con connected by the sea, have also a long historical relationship. In order to tackle our new challenges, Japan wishes to cooperate with Europe and India, which are at the forefront of these fields and with other like-minded countries in the region. Under these circumstances, high level discussions are more and more accelerating. Japan, Australia, India, US, Quad Leaders Video Conference was held on March 12th, showing a strong commitment to, to the Indo-Pacific region and launched working groups on one, vaccine, two, critical and emerging technology, and three, on climate change. Although the Quad is not and an organized institution, it is expected that it will effectively function as a framework for key players in the region. In addition to the Quad meeting, some important bilateral meetings are also taking place. For the EU and the European Union countries, I would like to stress that on January 25, uh, Foreign Minister Motegi attended the EU Foreign Affairs Council for the first time as uh, Foreign Minister of Japan, which was an opportunity for Japan to gain better understanding and support for the, from the EU for FOIP. For India, prior to the Quad Leaders Meeting video conference, we had a summit telephone talk on March 9th, 
and share the recognition that cooperation towards realizing HOIP is becoming increasingly important. The two leaders had another summit telephone talk on April 29. In relation to United States, Japan US Security Consultancy Committee, Japan 2 plus 2, uh, Japan US 2 plus 2, was held in person on March 16th, and the Prime Minister Suga visited the United States and held Japan US summit meeting on April 16th while confirming further strengthening of the Japan US alliance and cooperation with other like minded countries for the realization of HOIP. Significant mo movements are also based on the European front. Immediately after the US China foreign ministers meeting in Alaska on March 18th and 19th, U.S. Sec State Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visited the, here in Brussels on March 24th, having the meeting with EU Foreign Policy Chief Joseph Borrell and Belgian Foreign Minister Sophie Wilmeth. He visited Brussels again on April 13 and made a speech at NATO headquarters calling for the reunion of alliance. Furthermore, US President Joe Biden will travel to the UK and Britain in his first overseas trip as a US president in June. Concerning uh, the relations with, with India, just two days ago, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, today, on May 8th, the EU and India held a, a virtual summit meeting to discuss issues including connectivity and FTA. Now we are gathering on attend, to attend this seminar, which aims to explore the potential for trilateral cooperation between Japan, Europe, and in India. I hope I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the Japan program and all of those who have a concerned to hold this seminar in such a timely manner following the last November seminar. Same as November's discussion, I'm looking forward to hearing free and open discussion uh, of the speakers and participants, which I believe uh, bring the new ideas and recommendations about the convergence of visions and approaches between Japan, Europe, and India, which regard, with regard to maritime security and connectivity in the Indo-Pacific region. I hope our joint effort to maintain and strengthen a free, open, and rule-based international order will bear concrete outcomes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and apologies again to all our uh, participants for this uh, mashup. I hope you will uh, understand. Apologies to our uh, next speaker as well, uh, who I'm uh, most uh, delighted to welcome. I hope that these remarks also serve uh, uh, or feed into, into your own presentations on, uh, on the Indian side. Dr. Abhijit Singh is a senior fellow and heads the Maritime Security Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation, a prominent Indian uh, think tank on international security and affairs. Um, most, um, most pleased to have you uh, and, and looking forward to hearing your comments from the Indian perspective. Abhijit, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking here today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the VUB's Japan program for inviting me for this event. Uh, I think it would perhaps be fitting for me to start by saying that uh, this is a, a moment of crisis for India. Um, the, the country is going through a, a calamity of uh, unprecedented proportions uh, where uh, COVID-19 has triggered the kind of turmoil that arguably we've not seen uh, since the time of independence. Um, and as case counts are rising, as you know, fatalities are rising, this is a, a moment of reflection for many of us in the uh, strategic community about uh, what the country's aims and ambitions uh, should be. But it's fair to say that at this point in time, everything in the country uh, is being looked at through the prism of the pandemic. Um, who's giving us medical aid? Who's not giving us medical aid? 
who's helping with vaccines, who's helping with oxygen concentrators and, and ventilators. There's just one criteria to judge who's friendly and who's not so friendly, who's you know standing up to the plate to provide India with all the assistance that it needs. And at this point in time, I, I've, I hasten to add that um, Japan um, and the EU, in particular, France, Germany, and UK have stood up uh, as India's uh, good friends. They have mobilized quickly, unbiddingly, and provided uh, all the aid and assistance with great, great alacrity, for, for which a lot of us here are, are indeed very grateful. Um, uh, but, but the real point that I'm getting at is that the domain of geopolitics and the domain of maritime security is in subtle ways being impacted by the pandemic. The talk in Delhi today is about working with partners uh, to secure the sea routes, uh, to maintain supplies of medical equipment. Um, challenges that were um, that only until some time back topped the agenda, you know, things like uh, piracy, armed robbery, trafficking, even tackling China, seem to have somehow taken a back seat. At this moment, everything is about saving lives, which is the primary concern. And while India would still like to be a security provider in the region, it would like to be a first responder in Asia and Maritime Asia, uh, New Delhi knows that it must focus at this moment all its energies in, inwards. Uh, that being said, the Indo-Pacific narrative in New Delhi is broadly being driven by what many have described as enabling partnerships or mini lateral groupings. I'll borrow a phrase that Garima had used some time back. This is uh, issue-based coalitions. That's what's driving it. That is the currency of the geopolitical discourse in India, and I would argue broadly in the Indo-Pacific region. So the quad, uh, the quadrilateral, the Quad plus France, and there was a uh, maritime exercise held only recently in the Bay of Bengal, which France participated. Uh, trilaterals that India has gotten into, India, Japan, Australia, India, Australia, Indonesia, India, Japan, the US, and now uh, this talk about India, uh, uh, Japan, and EU, or Europe. Uh, this is what is driving the conversation forward. Now, uh, I have three insights or observations to make um, about mini laterals or, or these issue-based coalitions. Uh, before we get into a more specific discussion, possibly in the Q&A on what India, Japan, and the EU can do together. The first is that maritime ma ma uh, multilateralism uh, can often see, seem like a ploy uh, or, a, or a tactic to, to counter you know, adversaries in, uh, in your region of interest, in this case, the Indo-Pacific, the adversary being China. But I would posit that the objectives of these issue-based issue coalitions go far beyond just countering opponents in the literals. In the new world order, uh, partnerships imply a willingness to compete, to also compete with, uh, with each other and with, with your opponents. And it bears mentioning that the People's Republic of China has enormous traction in Southeast Asia. It is a major source of economic aid investment. It's a provider of security goods. And I talk not just about hard assets, that the Chinese are providing to Southeast Asia, but also the fact that lots of soft security services like uh, survey operations, salvage operations are all being done by China. Uh, cast your mind to the fact that uh, uh, Indonesia just lost a submarine and who's helping them salvage that submarine? It's China. So, so to understand what China means for the South, for Southeast Asia and an importance of, of China as a, as a security provider in the space, we need to look around you know, what are the little things that China does, help with search and rescue, you know, when the, uh, uh, when the Malaysian aircraft went down, it was China that took the lead in, um, uh, in searching for that aircraft. So I think this is something that we cannot uh, take, our, take our eyes off. Um, my second observation is that multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, it, it seems like a coercive tool, but really it's important that the coercive tool is highly overrated. Uh, the fact is that maritime posturing works differently in different spaces. For instance, the Indo-Pacific region, while it's one integrated strategic theater, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific have very different dynamics of security. The Pacific is a more contested space, and we know that it has uh, a number of you know, sovereign conflicts over territory, maritime disputes. Uh, the Indian Ocean is, is more benign in comparison. You know, it's, it's, it's a theater of non-traditional security issues. What works very, very well in the Pacific sometimes doesn't work so well in the Indian Ocean. 
But there's two other things that need to be said. One, that even if you look at China and the sort of strategies that it is following in the region, and I say this because a lot of Indian analysts are very keen on establishing a narrative to counter China. China has two different strategies for the Pacific and the Indian Ocean region. The Chinese are highly uh, aggressive in the Pacific because it's a rim area. It's, it's their backyard. Uh, and so you see gray zone operations, you see maritime maneuvering, you see, you know, uh, you know what's, what's called salami slicing in that space. In the Indian Ocean region, the, the Chinese want to position themselves as stakeholders, as benefactors, as goods providers. So what works uh, for China in the Pacific uh, doesn't work for China in the Indian Ocean. We've got to keep that in mind. Now, the upshot for some of us that are looking for ways in which to cooperate with the EU and with Japan is really that multilateral groups need to combine in different ways. Um, and and we will need, uh, while we might need a greater trust on military maritime operations in the Pacific, as is the case, you know, if you look at the EU, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if you look at the, uh, the United States, you look at Japan, you look at Australia, their trust towards maritime operations is more prominent in the Pacific than it is in the Indian Ocean. And that perhaps seems the right way to go. What we need in the Indian Ocean is a composite strategy, a strategy that has maritime operations is just one part of it. The rest of it is economics, it's infrastructure building, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, connectivity creation, it's capacity building, it's technology, you know, all of the areas in which the Chinese have come up with a proposal, we need a counter proposal so that we can create options for the countries in the region. And I'm happy to say that the strategy that was released really sometime back half on exactly these areas. So I see a lot of convergence between India, Japan, and, and, uh, and the EU in this space. Now, a third observation, final observation, is that the European experience, um, just the way in which the Euro Europe has come around in all of these years from being a, 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 what I would call a skeptic of the Indo-Pacific to now a believer, you know, a proponent of, of the Indo-Pacific concept, uh, tells you that uh, multilateralism is in some ways also about reaffirming identity. It is also about retaining agency and, and, um, and relevance in the space. So, so the talk in the EU going into the, these whole deliberations to come, come up with a strategy was that, do we want to be relevant in the space? And I suppose that is something that India and Japan have also been discussing. If we want to be relevant in the free and open Indo-Pacific region, we will have to look for ways in working for each other. Now, the important thing is this, that as partners come together, they might not always act in unison on areas in which they don't fully agree. For instance, when it comes to countering China, it's possible that India, EU, and J Japanese uh, positions do not fully align. That should not mean that we should not work together. There should be space for us to work together in areas where we can and look for overlaps in areas where we kind of disagree with, with, with each other. With regard to India's specific uh, challenges in the Indian Ocean region and what we can do with our partners, particularly Japan and the EU, I'd like to say just two things. One is that we are beset by both traditional and non-traditional issues challenges in the region. The, uh, the prominent discourse in India is, of course, that you know it's China that's the big threat to, to India, and particularly in the aftermath of the, uh, in, in, of the developments in Ladakh, the incident that happened in Galwan uh, only last year. India seems to have weird from this very inclusive, you know, uh, conciliatory stance in the Indo-Pacific to a rather more um, assertive stance, um, a more combative stance towards, uh, towards China. And, uh, and there's many that are saying that, uh, look at the Chinese, they are going to use that Bay of Bengal facilities, the ones that they've set up in, in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh, Myanmar, et cetera, to harm Indian interests, to undermine Indian interests. But there are also others who point to the fact that at this point in time, um, China won't like to up the ante in the Indian Ocean region. In fact, if they're at all as a threat, it is from non-traditional security. So, uh, you know, look at uh, what's happening with marine governance. Uh, you know, look, look at what's happening with IUU fishing or illegal fishing. Uh, the fact that there are huge, uh, uh, you know, dead zones being created in the Bay of Bengal. Um, the fact that there's so much of pollution being created uh, in the space. And so the, 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 the larger discourse uh, today in Delhi is that India also must look at some of these areas of marine governance, of climate change, um, of transnational crime, dealing with traffickers and, uh, and smugglers and pirates and armed robbers in the region. So, and I'm again happy to say that this is again one area where we could search for greater convergences with, uh, with Europe and, and, and with Japan. Three specific areas of cooperation. Let me just, just list them out because I know I'm running out of time. Maritime operations in, in South Asia. We would like it very much if Europe would expand 
its uh, you know uh, understanding of its areas of interest you know AOIs not just from the not just Gulf of Guinea or South China Sea but also the, also South Asia so that's one area where we go second maritime domain awareness capacity building in South Asia radar stations AIS chains patrol boats maritime patrol aircrafts what have you there's so many areas in which, in which we can cooperate and India and France are doing a lot in installing uh, satellites in the region um, and lastly as I said marine governance let's look at pollution climate change all of these things let's look at marine protected areas Europe and Japan can offer us their expertise in management Managing some of these marine protected areas and in doing marine spatial planning in the region. Uh, and with that, I will finally sort of stop and say that, you know, there's, there's a great deal of alignment between India, Europe, and, 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 and France. And even if, if the overlap isn't as much as you would ideally like, that's just okay. We're, uh, we're three independent uh, entities and uh, it's, it's not necessary that our visions always exactly align. And, and, and so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhijit. I couldn't hope for, for, for more. Uh, you, you covered it all. And of course, first of all, uh, accept our most sincere uh, thoughts uh, with, with the situation in India. Believe me that uh, all of us in Europe and I believe uh, around the world are watching the situation um, with uh, uh, keeping our breath um, and, 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 uh, and hoping for, uh, for the best, uh, of course. Um, but you, you, uh, you have managed to cover uh, an amazing ground, actually, and, and I'm really glad that you uh, highlighted the fact that we need to distinguish between the Indian Ocean region uh, and the priorities that we have uh, and the facts on the ground that we see in, in the Pacific as well. It's something that we tend to completely disregard when we talk about the, the Indo-Pacific as such, and you are very, very right that a lot of the non-traditional security issues uh, are quite specific to the Indian Ocean region, although we do find uh, a little bit in the Pacific as well. You very rightly pointed out the importance and the role of China, uh, which is, again, you know, is, is, is often the sort of stumbling block that we have when talking uh, with like-minded or less like-minded partners. And of course, for the concrete areas of cooperation, you know, I don't need to even write my, my, my key takeaways. It's, it's already there. You're, um, you're very right on that. Um, thank you so much. And to kind of conclude our little circle or tour de table, uh, I'll pass the floor to Dr. Nagao from the Hudson Institute, Na Satoru. Uh, I've known him for many, many years now. I know that it's one of the uh, prominent Japanese India watchers, uh, but also of you know, watching all the developments in the Indian uh, Ocean. So let's uh, cross perspectives now from um, with a view from Tokyo. Thank you very much. I will use the PowerPoint, so I will share my PowerPoint. Can you see? Yes, we can see fine. Thank you. Okay, that's good. So thank you very much for giving me a chance to make presentation. It's a great honor for me. Maybe you will face a perception of a gap between the country. My, it's okay. The title of my presentation is uh, Indo-Pacific. How should Europe, India, and Japan cooperate? The concept of the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. Japan was a pioneer. So Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's speech in the Indian parliament in the 2007, titled the Conference of Two Seas, indicates the concept of the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. So he said, by Japan and India coming together in this way. This broader Asia will evolve into an immense network spanning the entirety of the Pacific Ocean, incorporating the United States of America and Australia. Open and transparent, this network will allow people, goods, capital, and knowledge to flow freely. Why he needs these concepts? The view from his speech, there are two reasons. Firstly, he needs a concept including both Pacific and the Indian Ocean. The Indo-Pacific is a concept instead of the Asia Pacific, which did not include the Indian Ocean region. But because of the economical development, both Asia Pacific and Indian Ocean region is influential region of the world politics. Now, not only Europe, 
but also the Indo-Pacific region is increasingly emerging as an influential region in the world politics. For example, the British think tank, International Institute of Strategic Studies, published a book, The Military Balance, annually, and then 2030 version pointed out that nominal Asian defense spending, excluding Australia and New Zealand, overtook that of the NATO Europe in 2012. So therefore, we need new concept of all rising regions, including both Pacific and Indian Ocean. That is Indo-Pacific we need. So secondly, Prime Minister Abe to introduce both Indo-Pacific and Kuwait at the same time. Because this rising Indo-Pacific should not be China-dominated region. Prime Minister Abe explained his idea in his article, Asia's Democratic Security Diamond, which was published in Europe just before he was sworn in as a prime minister a second time in 2012. The Indo-Pacific is a concept including all countries around China and the Quad is all great powers except China. That is why he needs a Quad. So that is why Prime Minister Abe needs the Indo-Pacific and the Quad. And this idea is widely accepted in the world because recently China's attitude has been escalating. For example, in the East China Sea, China has increased its activities around Senkaku Island of Japan to reach more than 1,000 times per year. In the Taiwan Strait, China has also increased its deployment, and then U.S. Indo-Pacific Commander Admiral Philip Davidson to warn that China could invade Taiwan within six years. In the South China Sea, China has ignored the 2060 verdict of the International Court in Europe and constructs seven artificial islands with three runaways, and uh, while claiming the, these artificial islands have no military purpose, China is deploying missiles and military planes on them. According to Admiral Sunil Ramba, that time chief of the naval staff of the Indian Navy, Beijing has deployed six to eight ships, uh, warships, in the Indian Ocean. A number of China's incursion in the India-China border reached 663 times per year. And in 2020, on the India-China border, 5,000 Chinese troops enter the Indian territory and clash with Indian troops, causing 20 Indian soldiers sacrifice their lives and 76 others were injured. This China's attitude, this China's attitude has three important similarities related with security, economy, and value in this. So, firstly, and militarily, China's behavior is an exploitation of power vacuum. For example, in the South China Sea, China occupied half of the Paracel Island just after France withdrew from Indochina in 1950s. In 1974, China expanded its presence to all of the Paracel Island after the US withdrew from South Vietnam. Additionally, China occupied six feet of the Spratory Island after Soviet Union decreased its military presence in Vietnam in 1988. And again in 1995, China laid claim to mischief reef after US troops withdrew from Philippines. Same pattern. So secondary, economically, China has used its financial power to expand its sphere of influence. China has used Hogan infrastructure projects known as the Belt and Road Initiative to expand its sphere of influence. In one of the those projects, Sri Lanka leased its Hanban Tota port to China for 99 years. Indeed, because China's rapid military modernization and Belt and Road Initiative are dependent on ample budget. Therefore, the economy is main front of the maritime security. In terms of the democratic norms and values, 
China has repeatedly disregard for the international law and the democratic process when laying claim to new territory. For example, in the East China Sea, China did not claim the Senkaku Island before 1971. China's attitude has since changed due to the potential existence of oil reserve in the East China Sea. And indeed, because Senkaku Island uh, in the strategic location to pressure Taiwan, China has started to lay claim to this area. How should Europe, India, Japan respond to this situation? There are three things we should do. First, we should improve our security framework and the capabilities. For a long time, the hub and spoke system, the left one of this figure, has maintained order in the Indo-Pacific. Under this system, both Japan and Australia are US allies, but Japan and Australia share no close security relations. Thus, this system is heavily dependent on the US military power. All of the information gather US, but other countries do not share. So, but this system is currently failing to deter China's aggressiveness. As a result, right side, new security framework has emerged. In this system, US allies cooperate with other US allies and with each other. For example, Japan and Australia uh, coordinate through the bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral security cooperation. And the network of these many level of cooperation between allies and friendly countries from one big security framework. This system is still US lead, but US allies and friendly countries share more of security burden. Recently, European countries have grown interest in the Indo-Pacific. Last month, the United Kingdom decided to dispatch its aircraft carrier battle group in the Indo-Pacific. Recently, the French aircraft carrier and the nuclear submarines also came to the Indo-Pacific. In January, Germany decided to deploy frigate to Australia. The view from sharing security burden, these moves are welcome. And by using the new framework, Europe, India, Japan should support frontline countries like Taiwan, Vietnam, and Philippines, et cetera. Second, Europe, India, Japan must reduce our economic dependence on Beijing because China's rapid military modernization are depend on ample budget. Furthermore, Europe, India, Japan should also cooperate to assist the development of infrastructure in the country around China, uh, including Southeast Asia and South Asia. When Sri Lanka decided to accept China's investment with high interest rate, Sri Lanka had no other investor options. So Europe, India, Japan should cooperate to suggest alternative infrastructure project to developing countries like Sri Lanka. In terms of the democratic values, EU, Japan, uh, EU, India, Japan must continue to respect rule-based order grounded in current international law. If other countries believe that non-democratic China is a model for success, Europe, India, Japan will increasingly lose influence in the future. So in summary, Europe, India and Japan should cooperate with the US militarily, economically, and on the value related issues. Now is the time to do so. Thank you very much. That's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satoru san. Uh, you are right. We should all cooperate, including also with, with our uh, other partners, uh, of course, the United States and, and others. And we're back into this idea of flexible minilateralism and, and variable geometries that we are, that is somehow in the, the core of this discussion. Now, um, we have received uh, quite a number of uh, this, of, of questions, of course. So now the Q&A session is officially open. 
so do not hesitate to post your questions or upvote the um, existing ones uh, because you have the power to shift them uh, up in our list of uh, priorities, but we hope to answer them all. Before I start with the ones that you can see, there was an early uh, request from the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs from Director Yoshitake to make a, a quick comment and, and take the floor uh, right after uh, the panelists' addresses. So I'll pass the floor to Tokyo very quickly and then uh, we can move forward. Yoshitake-san. Eva-san, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, the keynote speech and the pre three presentations were very, very helpful for us. Um, I can say that momentum is rising for the realization of a free and open Indo-Pacific. I can say that, that there is no other best timing to hold this webinar uh, regarding the cooperation among uh, Japan and EU and India. Because I must say the missing link of the trilateral relations was enhanced last week. Um, based upon the keynote speech and three uh, uh, presentations, I would like to point out three points. Uh, concerning the cooperation among Japan and EU and India. First, there is already a, cooperate, a cooperative relationship in bilateral context between Japan and EU and India respectively. Second, the possibility uh, of a cooperation among three, especially, specifically uh, in the areas of uh, connectivity and then uh, maritime security are expanding. Third, uh, the three countries as a, a democratic nations are share, who, who are sharing uh, universal values need to further strengthen cooperation in order to prevent authoritarianism from spreading in the developing countries. Starting from first one, Japan India has a special, a special strategic global partnership. And in addition to EPA, there are Japan India 2 plus 2 and also AXA in the security field. Japan and EU have SPA and EPA as a uh, legal basis for cooperation. And EU and India hold a summit meeting, so-called 27 plus one on uh, May 8th. There, there is uh, always a possibility of 27 plus one, one as Xi Jinping of China. The, the EU and, and India sent a significant message that Mr. Modi was the first leader who was invited to 27 plus one after issuing a G EU strategy on Indo-Pacific cooperation. The commitment to a free and open inclusive rule-based Indo-Pacific was relieved. And I might say that this was the missing link. Second, Japan. EU and India uh, may promote cooperation in a wide range of fields. First, in connectivity. Japan, India connectivity partnership include specific areas such as digital transportation, energy and human, human interactions, which are with uh, the regional areas such as Central Asia, Africa and Indo-Pacific. These are the areas and regions all specified in the Japan EU connectivity partnership. I might I emphasize that. And Japan, India is always already promoting third country cooperation, such as in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. So the three countries, three uh, pillars have laid the foundation for presenting, presenting alternatives in connectivity area to these countries. Next is security, especially the maritime security. The EU and India expressed to strengthen the cooperation between the EU's operation Atlanta and Indian Navy. In this field, Japan and the EU realized the first joint port call in Djibouti last October. In addition, today and tomorrow, Japan and EU are conducting joint exercise with the participation of Djibouti Navy and Coast Guard for the first time it, 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 it may have opened the way for India to participate in such cooperation. I believe this, is, this has become an issue for Japan-India cooperation to be strengthened in the context of, for example, Japan-India 2 plus 2 or bilateral ocean dialogue. But I want to emphasize that the democratic nations that share universal values, the three 
have a responsibility to prevent the spread of authoritarianism in developing countries. At the EU-India summit, it was expressed that the world's two largest democracies promote world-based global order. Indian foreign minister was invited to the recent G7 foreign ministers meeting. At the G7 foreign ministers meeting, deep concern was expressed about unilateral attempt to change status quo. Last month, the EU expressed concern in the uh, spokesman's uh, statement that Chinese fishing boat, fishing vessels has gathered in the South China Sea. It is essential to raise a voice in the international community and it is always being questioned whether India can fulfill such responsibility. In that sense, it is significant that Quad, Japan, US, Australia, India was upgraded the ministerial level last year and to the le uh, leaders level this year. India has trilateral cooperation, India, China, Russia, in addition to Japan, US, India, but the Quad is the basis for cooperation in Indo-Pacific for India. This Quad is not only political framework, but also a framework for co uh, concrete cooperation in maritime security and cyber, and the Quad has agreed to create working groups on vaccine, climate change, and significant emerging technologies. Promoting such concrete cooperation will provide alternatives for developing countries. Finally, I would like to point out importance of cooperation in narratives, narrative world, in addition to cooperation in real world. To this end, public diplomacy and countermeasures to authoritarian narratives and disinformation are essential. It is important to broaden the understanding that freedom of press and freedom of media are necessary for happiness for all people, even in authoritarian countries. The Japan, EU, India are responsible for work working together with the United States and other like-minded countries in this matter. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Director uh, Yoshitake. This is um, this was very helpful, and it's uh, very useful uh, for us uh, experts also to see that we have uh, decision makers um, that are you know willing to that that understand all the stakes that are there that are listening also to to what we have to say, uh, and and I think that that's really the recipe uh, for success in 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 the long term for uh, all our work. So uh, thank you very much once more. Um, you, I'm, I'm turning now to our three speakers. You have access to the Q&A session, so I hope you had the chance to read the questions um, uh, yourselves, but I will regroup them and repeat them. Uh, I'll take the first batch uh, of three. Uh, we have uh, exactly half an hour, so we have time. Um, and, and, and they are all rhymed in, in, in the same direction. They're very uh, focused on, on maritime security, which is our topic. Um, I would say, let's say the first batch would go, or, or first group would go to Garima on the EU's involvement uh, in FONOPS, uh, in, the, in the defense of freedom of navigation, how serious it is, uh, given uh, some of the signals that you, you mentioned, actually, Germany potentially sending a, a ship to China, for instance, is that in line with defending freedom of navigation? And a related question, I would say, what do we mean by meaningful naval uh, presence, which is, uh, of course, uh, stated in the Indo-Pacific strategy, I would say, I would group these two specifically uh, for you. Um, then I would imagine Abhijit would be the right person to, to answer some of the others, uh, notably the one on uh, if you suggest that we may not have all our interests aligned between those three uh, partners that we're discussing in terms of freedom of navigation, how can we actually uh, move ahead, right? I mean, if there is a, a way to combine perhaps um, uh, our actions or, or, or agree on, on, uh, on some way. Uh, and finally, on Quad plus three, um, Quad uh, UK, France and Germany, uh, 
could it not send a wrong message? What exactly could be an area where the, these, this formation could cooperate? I don't know if that's for all of you or any of you who'd be interested uh, in this question. So roughly more uh, information about a meaningful naval presence on the European side and whether there's any contradictions. I believe we uh, implicitly mean in the South China Sea, there's explicitly in some question and implicitly in, in the other. Quad plus three and how to bridge, let's say, a uh, lack of common, uh, an alignment of interest, lack of common interest and, and, and divergences in addressing the problem of freedom of navigation. I'll start with these three uh, and we'll keep the rest for the next batch if that's okay. Gary, you want to start okay. if you're ready? Then yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. So I'd like to make three points. First of all is that security engagement in the Indo-Pacific is not just military deployment. That, that, of course, is one part, but it's broader. We have to be very careful and realistic as to what Europe can contribute in the region. European navies have resource constraints, and they are also involved in their near seas. Um, so to expect a meaningful European presence in the Indo-Pacific, is that even a goal that we should aim for, is my, would be my counter question. Um, and I don't think that in terms of um, sensible burden sharing arrangement, we need to be able to send uh, European navies in a, in a major uh, sort of way in, in the South China Sea. Um, this will remain symbolic, but what, sim what signals are we sending through symbolic presence in the region is very important. And that's why I agree with the question asker, and this is something I, I said in my comments as well, that when Germany says it will send a frigate in the region to work with like-minded partners and then make support call in China, or explicitly says we will stay out of the 12 nautical mile zone. You don't have to say it explicitly because then you reinforce the claims of certain states. Um, I think what signals we are sending are very important. And we have to recognize that a lot of European navies do not have long standing experience of working in the region, and including the South China Sea. And perhaps it's also important for us to build our capacities before we engage in the region and talk closely with with our like-minded partners. Second, what does you know, meaningful European presence in the region mean? Again, it's more than military deployment. I think Abhijit has outlined very clear areas where Europe can make a meaningful contribution to security challenges. We need to prioritize the Indian Ocean before anything else, because that is still in our extended neighborhood. Um, and we need to think about providing alternatives which um, to countries, whether it is on, um, because now climate change, technologies, capacity building, all of these have security implications. The distinction between traditional and non-traditional security is has never been more blurred. And um, the only country that is providing alternatives right now is China. We need to align our resources and think carefully because the EU is spending so much money on blue economy, on climate, uh, diversification of marine resources. We need to realize these are all strategic areas now, and we need to be careful as to how we engage. And for my, in my opinion, meaningful European presence has to be channeled through this prism. The third point I would like to make, and I really wanna take the quad question, because for years, the quad was seen as something that is not really useful in the in the sort of the Chinese would always put it as C form about to dissipate. And the critics of the quad, even in quad countries, said that it's not nothing more than a talk shop. Uh, there was not even a joint statement. Every country would come out with their own statements. Now we have the opposite tendency to see the quad as the panacea for all our problems. I have heard and read so many European articles saying Europe should join the quad or Europe should work with the Quad. Let us not forget, the Quad is not the Indo-Pacific. Satarusan gave a very great visual representation of the network architecture that's emerging in the region. The Quad is one of those networks. There's so many others. There's a supply chain 
coalition emerging. There's a connectivity coalition with the blue dot network emerging. There are so many different areas. So let us not think that we need to quote unquote join the quad also because there's no membership. It's not an institution uh, that we can simply join. I, I really do not want to see another European article saying, let's join the Malabar exercise. That makes no sense. <laughs> And I think we need, I'm, I have to be emphatic about this because I think we, that those directions are sort of wasting our energies. We need to look at where our capabilities and capacities lie. What is the best way to deploy them in the Indo-Pacific and where our partners see a role for us? I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karima. Uh, I wish we had more um, time and, and, and I hope we will eventually to discuss all this because I, I fully agree with a lot of things you say. Abhijit, um, would you like to add uh, your... Yes, thank you. Thank you, Eva. I, I, I think this is a very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, let me just begin by saying that um, I, I liked uh, Sataru San's presentation very much. And you know, there is uh, one part of me, the naval officer part of me that believes that what Sataru San says is the way to go. But, um, but there's an, a, another side of me that says that, uh, you know, we, you've got to just be a bit cautious when you're talking about uh, military operations. Um, because as they say that a, a shot fired uh, cannot be retrieved. Um, and, uh, and diplomacy and, and dialogue uh, are, are somehow much more potent than military forces in the long run, even though military forces, uh, maritime posturing uh, has its own, um, own importance in, in, in geopolitics. But let me just uh, come to the questions that uh, were posed and, and, and some of the other issues that came up in, uh, in the discussion so far. Uh, let me begin by saying that the Indo-Pacific uh, or the free and open Indo-Pacific um, there is a, um, a predicament at the heart of the concept of the uh, free and open in the Pacific, uh, which is that uh, it is well established as a concept. Uh, everyone understands that, well, you know, every, that the, the sea should be free, they should be open, uh, um, there should be inclusiveness, there should be transparency. We agree in principle to all of this, and there should be freedom of navigation. Uh, but uh, as a proposition, about what is it that the free and open Indo-Pacific can achieve and how is it that we go about achieving these goals, that is still a work in progress. So do, the, so do those that say that, well, you know, since your uh, interests do not fully align or you agree that there are certain areas in which, you know, partners cannot work together, does it mean that the Indo-Pacific is really a failed concept? I would say that, no, that's not quite the case. It's simply that we are looking for areas of overlap for common ground where we can work together. And let's also be cognizant of the fact that uh, if you're talking about freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, the fact of the matter is that the resident parts in the South China Sea are very uncomfortable with a lot of countries trying to assert their, uh, their, their dominance on their military power in that space. I mean, India and Japan and the EU can be fully you know, on board with going in uh, you know, power projecting or projecting power in the uh, South China Sea. But what if the Vietnamese, the, the Malaysians, the, the, the Filipinos don't agree with that? So we've got to take the region together. And a connected point to this is that of the Quad. I agree that the Quad has come a long way. And Garema is absolutely right. You know, till just about two years back, you know, it, it was criticized as being a talk show. Now, you know, everyone thinks that, you know, it is, it is that uh, silver bullet that will achieve us uh, all, our, uh, all our geopolitical goals. That's not the way it's going to be. And the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of us are talking about ASEAN centrality in uh, Quad. But, the, but many countries in ASEAN are very uncomfortable with the, with the whole concept of Quad and, and the Indo-Pacific because they think that it detracts from the centrality of ASEAN. It, uh, uh, ASEAN had its own way of doing things. They were very comfortable with the concept of the Asia-Pacific. This seems a bit forced to them. And they think that it's actually rammed down the throats of 
uh, of some of these ASEAN countries. So we've got to just be careful about the sensitivities. I would agree with, uh, with the proposition that we need to do more with regard to freedom of navigation. And so that was absolutely right. China is a threat. It is a threat in a way that it has never been. If you look at what, if you look at the pattern of uh, operations in the Pacific, especially what they're doing with the islands in the, in the strategies in the parasols. But is use of force, counter use of force at this point, the right way to go? I would argue no. What I would say is counter presence is the right way to go. Because if you are present in those waters, you are retaining your freedom of maneuver in those operations. And what the Chinese want is not actually to defeat the, 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 the perceived adversaries. It's actually to reduce, to curtail that freedom of, of, of maneuver in these spaces. So we should be present. And that's what the EU is planning to do. Uh, I mean, at least Germany, at least France uh, is planning to do. Might I just end with one little thing that we've got to be cognizant of the fact that consensus in the EU has so far been elusive. Even though we see that uh, 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 Indo-Pacific vision has been uh, has been released, the fact is that France, which is the major uh, um, maritime part in the region, and Germany, which is the quintessential, the the, the pivotal the political part in the region, don't quite agree on a number of issues, especially when it comes to uh you know military power projection in in the pacific france believes that what we need to go in for is a rules-based order and the, the idea that lies at the heart of a rules-based order is actually implementation how do you go and implement that order uh, enforcement of that order uh germany to my understanding believes in rules-based multilateralism what's at the heart of multilateralism is actually cooperation and engagement uh, as Gareva's uh, very interesting piece sometime uh, back pointed out. So I'm saying that unless we do not consider some of these sensitivities that European powers may have about you know, use of military force, we've got to be just a bit considered and careful about, cautious about using military power. But I'm completely with Sutaru San on this, that Ch the Chinese want this kind of confusion to prevail. They're happy to see this. So let's just sort of get our uh, discussions and our, um, our our ideas together on this. Thanks. Thank you so much, Abhijit. Um, yes, I mean, this is this is getting absolutely fascinating to if you if you ask me. Uh, but um, Satoru San, uh, you, there is a question specifically for you. Uh, so to give you uh, to give you the floor to not uh, leave you um, speechless, please give more details about avenues where India and the other first world nations can develop strategic spaces in the Indian Ocean. That would be one. And again, I'll take two more. Um, and here I must. Uh, okay, sorry, uh, Garima, you said you don't want to hear about Malabar, but there's a one question specifically on on the usefulness or the potential uh, of, of institutionalizing the uh, Malabar uh, exercise by you know, having perhaps more countries uh, participating more regularly. This is coming from uh, Plamen Tonchev. Um, and eventually could similar uh, joint drills contribute to, to building a sort of this network uh, architecture that, that you're alluding to. Somehow I feel that it's very quite similar to the presences concept that, that Abhijit was just talking about. So it, it's also about being present that uh, kind of makes the difference. And finally, and, and again, I guess it's a little bit related, um, a question from a participant from the International Crisis Group. Are there any constructive options for crisis management mechanisms in the sphere of maritime security? So uh, strategic spaces developments in the Indian Ocean only for uh, uh, Satoru-san, then Ideally, uh, well, it's a question targeting uh, Abhijit and Satoru on the Malabar exercises and the way they fit into the regional institutional architecture and a more general one on crisis management. Uh, Satoru, -san, may I start with you? Thank you very much. I received three. Okay. Okay. I try to reply the three questions, all of the three questions, but uh, try to. My answer should be the short one. And uh, first one, uh, uh, more fixed suggestion to the security of the Indian Ocean. Firstly, uh, we can focus in on the linkage between the India-China border and the East China Sea. View from China, two, these are the two fronts. 
So they need to divide their budget, the two sides, to maintain military balance. The eastern side and the southern side should cooperate to deter China's uh, aggressiveness. Because I have already explained that there is a pattern of the China's territory expansion by using the map of the South China Sea, map and history of the South China Sea. Uh, when they find the power vacuum, they try to expand. If there is no power vacuum, they will not try. So how to divide their ample budget is first option. So Indian Ocean region, including India China border area, that is one of the option of the cooperation. Second one is, uh, I have already suggested, uh, we, we should cooperate to suggest the alternative infrastructure project for countries like Sri Lanka, because this country cannot choose if suggestions only one. That's the second one. And uh, how to deal with the submarine in the Indian Ocean is very important uh, for security in the Indian Ocean indeed, because uh, China's submarine is not uh, is threat not only for Japan or Europe or the countries who have the sea lane, who run the sea lane in the Indian Ocean. This is the most important threat, most serious threat for India. Because uh, of course, uh, India's series of communication is located, but uh, this is not only one. If uh, India deploys nuclear ballistic missile submarine in the Indian Ocean, and if the Chinese submarine stay just side of it and say hello, this is not nuclear deterrence. When uh, India cooperate with uh, other quad countries and deploy the aircraft carrier, this submarine is a threat. So India cannot deploy it. So this submarine is a very important factor. So to deal with the submarine, how to cooperate? That is an important topic. Uh, that's uh, maybe answer of the first question. Second one, the institutional rights of the Malabar or quad. I emphasize that this quad is not a military alliance. I like military alliance, but uh, in this case, why I emphasize this? Because the quad in the Pacific is very big region. When we compare with the size of the country, EU and Indonesia is the same. So if we focus on the cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. What kind of effort, what kind of big effort, what huge effort should I do? So, but uh, we do not need to ally. We do not need to create alliance in this region because age of the alliance is indeed uh, just after the Cold War, the many countries allied each other. But after that, we cannot find uh, um, alliance Treaty based alliance between the great powers. Currently, we are living age of coalition of willing, more flexible, more case by case. So, in the Indo Pacific, one by one, case by case, we should cooperate. That's the answer. No need to say alliance like NATO. Of course, I like this word, Asian NATO, but we do not need to say. Third one, answer. When, okay. The, I challenge the topic itself indeed. Um, I did not say US-China competition is war. Because I repeated the emphasize this economy is main front. But uh, if we focusing on crisis prevention only, military crisis prevention only, this is outdated topic, I believe. When we see the US history, USA, they have only 244 years history. Yeah. But if that is true, US spent only 169 years to change from just a colony to the only one superpower in the world. In the last 75 years, they, con they have maintained their status. And during that process, US has not a law all rivals. So if the US say China is serious competitor, Japanese know that 
China will go, current China will be disappeared in the future. So what kind of world we will see? What kind of strategy we will have? EU, India, Japan want to be winner, don't? And uh, we should be the US side in the, I think. That's the answer of the third question. Uh, do not need to only focus on the crisis prevention. Well, I'm radical maybe, but uh, honestly, I believe it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Abhijit, would you like to continue? Yes, uh, so there were two questions, one on the Malabar exercises, and the second on crisis management. So on the Malabar, let me just say this, that uh, since 1992, when we first began the Malabar exercises, um, you know, this engagement has grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, and the fact is that uh, today it is uh, one of the most uh, complex uh, uh, maritime drills that the Indian Navy undertakes uh, with the US and, and with Japan. Um, so the last time we did Malabar, we invited uh, Australia also to join these exercises. That was uh, um, a step in the right direction and, and, and some positive movement. Although uh, I'm not sure the Australians uh, have uh, been accepted as permanent members. And that's because there is some hesitancy in the grouping to militarizing the Quad. Uh, so the fact that the, the Quad really is being posited as a position, as a, a, a platform of engagement and not quite a, a platform of deterrence. So uh, that means that there is only so much that you can do with Quad when it comes to, to, to military operations. Uh, but there's another point I want to make uh, with regard to uh, the Malabar exercises, which is that uh, there is this popular notion in the, in the minds of many strategists and, and, and tacticians that, uh, that the Malabar is really is about balance of power. And that is in, um, in some ways true, that the more exercises you do together with your partners, you're signaling to the other side that you have the agency, you have the power to be able to maintain that uh, balance in the, uh, in the maritime realm. Uh, but my uh, observation here is that as long as we stick to operations in the Indian Ocean region, we're really doing very little to maintain that balance of power. If you have to make your presence felt, or if you've got to do exercises to, to convey a message to China, these exercises must be held more often in the Pacific, because remember, that's the area that China is most sensitive about. The Chinese are not deploying their ships, uh, their submarines in Indian waters, or even the Indian Easies, you know, barring one or two freak um, exceptions. Uh, by and large, the Chinese are sending their ships through the, uh, through the highways, they're, they're through the slots. And the Malabar exercises can do very little to deter the Chinese from use of the slots. Uh, but but if Indian warships and if uh, you know U.S., Australian, Japanese warships were to be present in uh, perhaps the South China Sea, if not South China Sea, at least the Western Pacific, that will apply more pressure on on China. So I believe that the Malabar, again, like the Quad and the Indo-Pacific, is again a work in progress. We are looking for ways in which we can expand this. We don't. We were walking a fine line. We don't want to really militarize the Quad and try and. Uh, create uh, too much uh, mm, mm, turmoil in the region. Uh, 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 at the same time, we would like to signal to China that we mean business and the Chinese cannot ride roughshod over, uh, over the rules-based order in the region. The second very important question about crisis management, and I'm sad uh, to, to, to say that, unfortunately, there's very little crisis management that's happening, but that's because the major players are not willing to get into any kind of discussion on this. So the, so, the, so the Chinese and the US do have a bilateral arrangement, an MOU in which they exchange information about their assets in the region, but that apparently does not work so well. And that is because the Chinese tend to use not their naval forces, but their coast guards and their militias, which is basically their fishermen, to actually do a lot of this, this posturing at sea. So that breaks down. Now, Singapore sometime back proposed that we should have a crisis management arrangement for submarines because, you know, the Pacific is now being infested with submarines. But the Chinese did not agree to it because if you agree to the crisis management group, you're supposed to reveal the position of your submarines. No country is comfortable doing that. With India and China, there was a proposal made sometime back that based on something called the Inksi agreement that the, that the US had with the, with the Russians back in the Cold War, 
uh, that's a model to follow for India and China. Why don't we reveal our positions to each other? There would be greater confidence building. But the Chinese did not agree to that. And India also began to have second thoughts because the Chinese were sending their submarines into the Indian Ocean region as a way of signaling to India that you should start accepting China as a global player in the same way as you accept the US Navy. Please be comfortable seeing Chinese submarines floating around in the Indian Ocean. India was not willing to that, and therefore that broke down. So crisis management is an area where the huge, huge is a big sort of gaping hole in the whole architecture. And I agree that we need to make some progress forward. But that said, let me just end with this, that let us not underplay the development that has happened over the past few years. Especially, I have to say that with regard to Japan in the way Japan has moderated its free and open in the Pacific to look at more constructive screens. And the fact that EU has moderated it right to, to become a little more assertive with maritime presence in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, I think that we should take uh, great satisfaction from these developments. Thank you, Abhijit. I think crisis management is certainly one area when we can start digging a little bit deeper also in the in the trilateral um, talks we are having. Um, and it's time, we only have three minutes left and, and three <laughs> intriguing last questions. Um, so uh, this is the last batch. I will uh, let you also add, of course, uh, if you have any final thoughts uh, to, to wrap up. Um, but let me summarize uh, one fatalist. Uh, oh. I'll start with a more concrete one. Um, would, let's say, uh, an annual joint exercise between Atalanta, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Forces, and the Indian Navy uh, send the right message on uh, the like-mindedness of these three partners when it comes to maritime security, including in support of the freedom of navigation and the upholding of international law in the Indian Ocean. If I may, I think this is the right time also to add, perhaps if you have some thoughts on concrete ways um, or more concrete ways we, we can uh, you know, suggest these, these type of actions we can suggest to, to move forward. Um, the second on the role of ASEAN. Uh, we never talked about ASEAN. It's, we, of course, we cannot cover it all, uh, but there is a question of can ASEAN actually protest the Chinese encroachment and at the same time feel uncomfortable with Quad? I think that's basically what is going on. Um, and the final one, I call these a, 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 a necessary fatalistic question. You know, China is building up. Is there a chance we may see a major conflict at the end of this decade? So I think that's a, a good question for, uh, you know, to, to kind of leave us pondering on. Um, shall we perhaps start with the order of appearance with Garima, then uh, Abhijin, and uh, finish with Satoru, if that's okay. Um, I'll uh, very quickly make points because we are running out of time. On the question of what happens at the end of the decade, it's very hard to um, do strategic foresight given that we live in pandemic times and nobody was expecting this. I think we still have not considered what will be the impact of the pandemic, for example, on Indian foreign policy. Um, if the pandemic has an impact on India's health and economy and domestic infrastructure, would that not constrain the foreign policy choices India has and how it operates? So I think we, we do need to consider not just China, but also all the other partners where they're going. Um, secondly, on, on Atalanta, I mean, it is its mandate is anti-piracy. Maybe would be interesting to see if the mandate can expand as well, because if you're talking about challenges in the Indian Ocean. It's not just anti-piracy anymore. Um, there, there are so many other, including uh, China's presence, um, Djibouti, et cetera, et cetera. So is it the only answer forward? Um, I don't know. There is also a tendency, I think, in Europe to look for institutions in the region. Uh, will this exercise be institutionalized? Will the Quad be institutionalized? Because we are comfortable, Europe is comfortable dealing with institutions. Um, none of the countries in the region want to take that position because they, almost all of them, if you share a border with China, um, your sort of existential um, threat is different. And I think we'll have to operate through these networks, whether we like them or not. Would be interesting to explore, for example, the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium or increase military operability with New Delhi. Uh, when Delhi and China, uh, when India and China had the border dispute, would have been interesting to see a statement of solidarity from the European Union there as well. I think there are so many things 
which can contribute to um, maintaining the rules-based international order doesn't have to be the big ticket items. We, we can start with the smaller ones. A good um, um, development has been the EU has now a defense attache in New Delhi, but just building this architecture, interoperability, um, regular security and defense um, interactions, that would be, I think, the low hanging fruit and the first step in, in the direction and the next steps can come later on. Thank you, Garima. Uh, Abhijit, pick any, any you like or, or any final words. Yeah, right. So, so the, the two interesting questions, one on uh, Op Atlanta and what we can do. So, uh, so if we get into the specifics of what India and, and the EU are doing together, let me just say this, that, you know, uh, till until last year, there was a sort of cognitive mismatch between the EU and India, which is that the EU uh, was focusing its energies really on the uh, Western Indian Ocean or the Northern um, part of the Western Indian Ocean, because that's a, a sort of a European rim sea. Um, and, and, and let's not forget that uh, when uh, the EU came up with a maritime strategy in 2014, upgraded in 2018, the emphasis really was on the seas that surrounded Europe and, uh, and, and to a degree, the Western part of the, of the Indian Ocean region. So uh, the EU has something called the EU MACE program that it does a lot of capacity building in, um, in, in island countries, you know, Madagascar, uh, Seychelles, Mauritius, et cetera. Uh, so uh, rather than cooperate on Atlanta, which would be confined to the Western Indian Ocean, uh, the Indian view is that we should try and do more together in the Southern Indian Ocean, perhaps uh, extend the uh, Cremario program. And it has, in fact, in fact, in 2020, the critical maritime routes program of the EU has already been extended to the Indian Ocean region, but we are not seeing a lot of investment in that regard. Most of the focus of the um, of all the allocations made is in the Western Indian Ocean. So, so I so I believe that beyond Op Atlanta, Op Atlanta, India does a lot of work already with you. We need to look at some of these uh, ideas and how we can better use our fusion centers together. How we can collate information. How we can do exercise together. That's the way to go. The second question, uh, and I'll just end here, is about a conflict. Uh, do we see uh, a conflict happening? And Garima made some very interesting remarks. I would, uh, you know, sort of agree with that. But I would also add to what she has to say that you know, in the uh, Indian uh, maritime doctrine, there's a very interesting line which says that we live in an era of uncertain peace, and that for me is is just the line that that sums up the the situation in which we are today, the scenario that we are today. That no one is prepared for war. But it's uncertain peace. Everyone's trying to undermine the perceived adversaries in subtle ways. So uh, I don't see an open war happening between the US and China, but these attempts to uh, curtail each other's uh, freedom of operations, as I said, to undermine each other are going to continue. There's going to be block building and alliance building and, and hub and spoke and networking and all of that happening. The Chinese are going to keep continuing with the, their activities, their gray zone operations in the South China Sea. I don't think they're really keen to go into an open war, but that does not mean that China does not pose a threat because as I often say that the biggest danger to India and like-minded partners is that China wins without firing a shot. And so we've got to plan for that contingency. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Sadarusan, your final words. Thank you very much. The, about the suggestion uh, related to Atlanta, so this suggestion is welcome, of course. And in my memory is right, the Quad plus France the joint naval exercise has already conducted recently. So this suggestion is also the one of the line. This is very effective to promote interoperability and relations, I believe. So that is good and welcome. Thank you very much. Well, that was that was brief. And I just want to remind that the mandate of Atalanta has indeed been expanded to include uh, drug and arms trafficking transfers. And of course, there's been many of us trying to push for more, but there are obvious uh, institutional limitations that we have to uh, uh, understand. Um, thank you so much. Uh, honestly, I, I really wish that we could uh, do this in person. I hope we will be able to do that uh, soon because there is so much to discuss more. I hope Hope we will get the chance to meet again uh, and to go perhaps a little bit deeper into into some of those questions 
Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, we will continue uh, talking about connectivity in the next panel. That's why you may notice that I did not deliberately answer uh, a one pending question here uh, on connectivity because that will be a topic of the next session. Um, thank you so much to Tokyo, to New Delhi and to Brussels uh, for, for, for plugging in. If you're, you're of course more than welcome uh, to stay with us for the next sessions. Otherwise we will break for uh, until 10.45. Um, help yourself with a, I wish I could offer you some coffee, but help yourself with your own coffee. Uh, and uh, thank you so much again for your very insightful uh, comments and remarks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.